Give me one second. I'm going to share my screen. We'll start the panel in just one minute here. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Uh, uh, Netflix loves being a part of Enigma, and we are so thrilled that you've all joined us here after hours um, at this event that's only after hours for some of us and in the middle of the day for others, this brave new post uh, time world that we're all in. Um, and thanks so much to the panel also for joining us. Uh, we're so incredibly jazzed to have you all here. Um, we've got this brilliant group of people here who run um, AppSec and ProdSec programs. Um, and uh, we're, we're glad that you are all good sports. Uh, we know that we gave you kind of uh, not so much information going into this because we wanted to take a little bit of a different tack with the panel. But um, I just want to uh, have you all do some quick introductions. So um, let's have the panelists. Um, why don't you tell me who you are? what you do, and then um, just because we're in this asynchronous world now and asynchronous work is so important, um, what's your favorite reaction emoji that you use in Slack to communicate with your team members? Uh, my personal one is the party parrot is uh, my favorite one. So let's start with, uh, let's just go in the order we have on the screen. So let's go Mike, Nitsen, Arcady, and then Asta. Awesome. Thanks, Julia. And I want to say just off the bat, thanks, Julia and, and Patrick, for putting this all together, putting in that hard work to uh, bring us a good surprise. I am Mike Shima. I work um, uh, at Square, and we're going through a transformation from product security to a more strategic security partner model. And um, so I'm actually quite interested in finding out what uh, we should leave behind on product security, maybe what we can pick up more from this new security partner model, um, as we talk about here. And for React emojis, I'm definitely going to have to go with the horn. So that's why I probably throw down the most. And um, occasionally I'll sneak into good Spock hands, but. Awesome, thanks, Nitsen. Hi everyone, and thanks for having me. My name is Nitsen, I'm a product security lead at Spotify. And we have um, two arms kind of to our AppSec program. One is on the more the automation and tooling and the other one is more on the manual. And, um, I'm very interested actually in, in everything that we have to say. I don't know Family Feud, so I'm going to be double grilled. My favorite reaction emoji. So this is interesting because when we started uh, being remote back in, in March 2020, it was just a very vanilla thumbs up. And now I've graduated to the green Spotify heart. Give it more love. Awesome. Arcady. Um, awesome. Likewise, thanks. Um, Julia and Patrick and Netflix for putting this together. Um, my name is Arkady. I work on uh, application and infrastructure security at Chime. We have two squads. One focuses on you know, the code of our applications. One focuses on our cloud security. And uh, my favorite Slack emoji is probably, I don't know if this is the, one of the defaults or just in our workspace, but it's like a spicy a spicy pepper, and we constantly, anytime someone says something even marginally, remotely spicy, we'll give it the spice pepper. Awesome. Asta. Uh, hi, folks. Uh, I'm Asta. I lead the application security team at Netflix. So our charter is to help Netflix put out secure software, both for running our streaming product as well as running our global studio business. That goes from like all the way down from the compute platforms to the AWS services that we write to run the business. Um, and then there is two teams that are a part of AppSec at Netflix. One is the security partnerships team that Julia and Patrick are on. And the other one is the AppSec engineering team that really kind of helps us scale ourselves as a function. And I'm excited to be here. I would say my favorite emoji uh, has been party cat. And I think it really speaks to, I'm not a pet person, and it really speaks to just the indoctrination of all the cat people in InfoSec at Netflix, uh, that that has become my go-to emoji. Uh, but maybe second best is like the pizza spin. That one's pretty good too. Those are both solid choices. All of, all of y'all's choices are solid. We'll have to get the spicy one into ours as well. Hot takes. Um, Cool, so I just wanna uh, also have a note on the format. So we've kind of alluded to it a little bit here. Um, we didn't give our panelists a whole lot of preparation at all. We wanted to take a little bit of a different tack on the typical panel uh, format that you might have seen a lot of times. So we, uh, ahead of this panel, we created a survey 
uh, to ask ProdSec and AppSec leaders about their programs, questions about what do you value, where do you spend your time, uh, what you're excited about, what, what are the hardest challenges you face. Uh, we sent it out to about 50 different product security leaders. Um, we got responses from 20 people. So there's not a lot of statistical significance or randomness or any of those things that you need to make it um, you know, kind of a statistically valid um, study. But um, uh, we just wanted to think of this more as like a scaled up version of having coffee um, with your um, peers who are willing to chat about kind of top shop, chat about their ProdSec programs. Um, and so we asked a whole bunch of questions and we pulled out what we hope are some of the more interesting uh, and surprising results and themes from those. Um, so we're asking our panelists here not to like directly answer the questions themselves, but to help us interpret the results that we've seen from these um, survey results that we've gotten in. So y'all haven't seen the data yet. Again, thank you so much for being good sports and for playing this game with us. Uh, we want it to be fun. We might end up poking a little bit at our industry, but we're all among friends here and we're kind of all in good, good humor doing this. Um, and then another note at the end, we will be taking audience questions. So if you've got questions to ask our panel um, or individuals on our panel, please pop them into the Q&A. We'll be gathering those up and then we'll ask them towards the end. All right, that being said, let's get started. So jumping right in to the exciting stuff. So overrated or underrated, we tried to, um, get a whole bunch of people to take opinions on things. So um, this is a lightning round. We asked our respondents a bunch of questions about um, the things that we do in product security and are they overrated or are they underrated or are they rated about right? Um, we're not gonna talk about the things that we rate about right because that's not as exciting. We're gonna talk about the things that we do that are overrated or underrated. Um, and so here I've taken out, this is the preview of the data. Um, here are the things that were most consistently voted overrated. I've highlighted the ones that were above 50% of our um, respondents said were overrated. Um, and I'm gonna give you a word bank here. Just slid that over. Um, what do you think of these things, panelists? Um, what floats to the top of that list? I saw Mike and Asta unmute, so a race. Uh, static analysis. Okay, we got one vote for static analysis. I think pen testing is an easy one to throw up there. Okay, pen testing, top of the list. I think Arcadi, WAPS. WAPS is number one for me. WAPS, okay. I'm going to be with Ashta actually, uh, static <laughs> analysis. <laughs> so fascinating. All right, um, let's let's see what it is. So the big reveal, it's threat intelligence. So I'm um, curious as to what, what do you guys think with um, threat intelligence floating to the top of that list? Does that ring true? It sounds like for me, it rings, it definitely rings true because a little bit of it is what threat intelligence means, what's the context of your org? And does it really matter that some big APT in this country or this other country is targeting you? And maybe that's the case when you have a few hundred million users and you have a lot of very sensitive data. But um, if you're smaller, threat intelligence is more about did you patch or not? And I think that's what why that doesn't surprise me being over being so high. I would say that we have maybe figured out a little bit more of how threat intelligence should uh, uh, impact our overall sort of enterprise security or the overall InfoSec program. But when it comes to the ProdSec space, maybe we haven't figured it out of like, what is the way to use threat intelligence in a valuable way on the ProdSec side of things? That, that's my assumption on why that's up there. Yeah, I'll, uh, I'll echo that sentiment. I think that it's probably very relevant for like SOC or incident response teams, but for ProdSec, what are we, and are we supposed to, have alerts on some IP addresses. I don't know. It just it, I've never found it very useful. All right. Um, cool. So we're not going to go. We're not going to go through and make you guess like the order of every single one of these things. But I do want to hear uh, what do you think maybe falls into the second one. And if it's the same as your first guess, that's totally fine too. I'll stick to my first guess. Stick to your Thanks. first guess. <laughs> I think still either okay. WAPS or maybe CSP. Okay. CSP. CSP? 
All right, so ding, ding, ding. Arcadi got this one right. So uh, Arcadi, why is why are WAFs overrated? Uh, because if you have some sort of like, you know, SQL injection or cross-site scripting or whatever it is, the underlying bug is still there no matter what. Even if the WAF blocks it, you still have to fix the issue. Also, it frequently will make it harder for, um, you know, another item on here is bug bounty programs. It'll make it harder for researchers to test and actually discover those issues and report them to you. Um, so I, I don't find them particularly useful. Okay. So it's interesting because I, because these are things that I think um, we hear a lot of hype about. So maybe maybe another way to interpret this is like overhyped. So do we see a lot of our industry maybe like hyping this stuff or thinking about it as gonna solve a whole bunch of problems and falls flat on its face? So um, is there an element of that? What are what are your thoughts? I'm going to guess there's an element of that as well as. WAFs are where, where do you can how easily can you deploy and manage the WAF because it's is it just making your app more brittle um, especially if you can drop it out into the cloud and it, do you just need that versus use a React front end or are you even do you have a stack that's exposed to SQL injection or is it even exposed to SQL injection due to the nature of what you're doing, which what your uh, data backing store is? And um, so I'd guess more it, WAFs definitely I can see overrated, maybe overhyped, especially if you're going into with a, that late 90s, early 2000s mentality of what a WAF is doing. I think there could be something to tease out if you're talking about the, like an API abuse perspective in the sense of maybe something as simple as rate limiting or finding out what is bad behavior as opposed to bad data. And that's where for me, maybe there's a, a glimmer of hope for WAFs to um, find a, a better rating in this model. Uh, yeah, I would say plus one to like specific use cases for which uh, modern WAFs can be used the right way of like, what, what exactly are you trying to achieve? Is it availability related things? Is it just kind of first level blocking, things like that? Again, like it'll have to be a part of your like overall defense and depth strategy. It's not going to be the end all be all of like, okay, I have a wrap, everything's okay now. Cool. Yeah, thanks. I, yeah, I think I tend to agree with a lot of those sentiments as well. Depends how you use it. Um, cool. So, going to do the big reveal here. So, here's kind of how the top seven things came into our list as overrated. So, um, there's one thing in particular on this list that I'm surprised by, um, which is actually like just our bug bounty programs. Cause I would think like maybe two years ago, this would have been on our underrated list, right? Like the way that I think we were talking about it in the industry. So like, I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts. Like this seems like a fall from grace, uh, honestly. And so I wanted to hear, what do you think that journey was? Um, or bug bounty or like how how do you uh, see this data coming from peers in a coffee shop? Nitin, how about you? Yeah, I mean, I think it's uh, it's it's interesting to for me to see it as well. I would say in 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 Spotify, it's still it falls in in vulnerability land. Uh, and and vulnerability land is is a mixed bag that I think we're all kind of fine tuning, uh, and often what what I hear from other peers in the industry is, you know, uh, those who went really extreme and they're like, that's it, we're done with the vulnerabilities. It's so much noise and it doesn't bring the investment on return. And then of course comes in the vulnerability that takes you down, and you have to revive the program. So I would say I myself am still. A kind of weighing the pros and cons and being a Middle Eastern superstitious person, I will not kill it just because of that, because I know that once I will kill it, it will come back to bite me. Um. Yeah, I see that. The, the one aspect I see is definitely the, as, uh, the part of you, you need a bug bounty program for that vuln disclosure. Just so there, there is a mechanism. And I think where, for me, where it becomes overrated is that how mature do you have your program, in, meaning your own product security program? I mean, you're either able to have some better architecture or you have the tools internally, whether it's static analysis, it might be a bit overrated here, maybe dynamic analysis, it's not quite too overrated on, the, on this list. But if you have a bug bounty program that's new and you're just subsidizing a bunch of bug bounty researchers to run Durbuster or Burp Suite and all the tools that you could be 
be running yourself, then it's going to be overrated. And um, it, it's sort of a, a vuln finding mechanism. So I'm a little surprised it was ranked on the overrated list. I don't think I've ever worked at a company where I didn't get a whole lot of value out of a bug bounty program. It's always been hugely valuable for us. Um, definitely there's something to be said about like your engineering team, your vulnerability management process needs to have some level of maturity. You can't just jump into it, but it's always been very valuable for us, um, not just for resolving the vulnerabilities, which can be a little bit whack-a-mole, but just to give us interesting data around what areas of the product have the most issues, where do we need to invest our time and energy as a security team, um, I've always gotten a lot of value out of it. Uh, yeah, I would say I was surprised to see that on here too, because I, I do think that, you know, for your holistic security strategy, a bug bounty program is an important part of it. Um, I think that we are going to see more and more security testing work to be gig-based in the future, because I feel like when I think about how to spend my security dollars, the most outsourceable thing becomes pen testing, both, uh, you know, like the pen testing engagements, as well as like the crowdsource bug bounty type stuff. And if I'm looking at the ROI, like the ROI is really, really high for what I'm getting for the dollar spent on bug bounty. Um, again, I'm not gonna pen test my way to security. I still have to hire really smart people like Patrick and Julia so they can make our frameworks more secure by default and work with engineering teams to get things fixed at scale and strategically. But I think bug bounty is an important tool in an overall security program. Really cool point. I like that idea. And I wonder if people responded to this in the sense of this is overrated is what the product security team's responsibility should do versus just like you were pointing out, why not just outsource this and, and hire someone to do this and let the product security team focus on something else? Yeah, exactly. Plus one on, on that. I think in terms of ROI, uh, th th this is definitely a, a very good investment on, on return and you're, you're blocking another blind spot. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for uh, jumping into that one with me. I was really curious about bug bounty programs being overhyped. Um, cool. Let's go for the inverse here. So here we've got our list of underrated things. So these were our top uh, seven underrated things that came in. Um, and so the first, the first two are tied. So if you get either of them, uh, we'll give it to you. But curious what you think comes in as the number one most underrated thing in product security. Communication skills. <laughs> communication skills. One vote. Awesome. I, I want communication skills to be on there. I just feel to uh, try not to be cynical about what the answers might have been. Um, but I'll say paved roads was going to get my solid vote for what people answered. Yeah, I, I thought the same actually about paved roads. All right, two tough. votes for paved roads. One I'm for communication guess. skills. <laughs> Yeah, I think for me, it's also either communication skills or maybe um, apps like people who can code. Dang. All right, we have to get a prize for Arkady <laughs> because I feel like he's gotten several of these. So we've got apps like people we can code and also um, communication skills. So these two are listed as the most uh, underrated things that maybe we have or do in product security. Um, I found this one pretty interesting because I I don't know that I feel like the industry does underrate those things. So like, I guess, why, why do you think it's on the list? Is it hard to hire these types of skills or like, what have you found in your program? Like, why is this maybe underrated? Even if we think of it highly, is it just hard to, hard to implement, hard to find? Yeah, I'm not sure how it relates to why people felt it was underrated, but I do think they're both extremely valuable. They are extremely hard to hire for. Um, communication, hugely important, obviously, if you're going to be collaborating with engineering all the time and trying to communicate risk or communicate issues that to different technical levels uh, of audience or other things like that is hugely important. Um, and AppSec people who can code, same thing. I think, you know, sometimes to me, the less important reason is that sometimes security teams have to like get their hands dirty and implement the fix themselves. And when you do that, it's useful to be able to code. Um, but the more important reason for me is that I think AppSec people who can code make better trade-offs. I think when security engineers who are not great coders come to an engineering team and say, 
can't you do X, Y, and Z or implement this thing and maybe don't grasp the like complexity or the cost of the solution they're proposing, um, that can be bad. And so I think engineers, AppSec engineers who can code are like hugely valuable. I, I think I was one of the people that said communication skills are underrated. And for me, the reason of that was, I think I don't see as much assessment of that on like hiring panels sometimes as I should, because yes, it's great to have like sort of that deep technical architecture skills and being able to like explain XSS in just excruciating amount of detail. But the thing that's really gonna make a dent is gonna be like, is your security person successful at getting buy-in from their customers, help explaining risk to them, being able to negotiate with them on impact and things like that. So I would like to see it more represented in how we interview for senior security roles and like what do we see as kind of like a crucial part of being successful at the job. Yeah, I, I came I came in maybe overly pessimistic on that one. And um, I really like your point. And, and Arcady, you made a real good point too about the, the both of you were saying, who are you talking to and adjusting your message for the audience? And I think that's one, it, it's also really hard to like interview for something like that, uh, unless you, you know, set up a mock interview. But I think one of the reasons I was pessimistic is that we don't see as an industry, I think, um, as much examples of that. We don't have, for example, what's the OWASP top 10 negotiation project? Or um, if we look at um, even just InfoSec um, uh, conferences, where are the tracks on communication techniques, communication skills or interpersonal skills? And um, if anything, one of the things I'm glad that I haven't heard so far is this is called a, a soft skill. Because one of the things I would love is making sure we, we reframe this into actually what we're talking about, communication, interpersonal, presenting to different audiences, talking about risk. Um, and rather than trying to dismiss it as some adjective that kind of is empty and meaningless. So I guess I would summarize that by saying, I'd love to see a, the, this aspect of communication skills have, have more references for people to learn and understand what that means and um, so they can model it and emulate it. Yeah, I really like that point. Maybe where the, where the rubber hits the paved road, right? You need the communication skills to help that you actually kind of get off the blocks and things and, and and uh, make good investments and, and changes in your program. Um, Nitsen, did you have anything to add? I wanna make sure you got a chance to talk to this one. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I was very happy to see the, the result because actually this is a, for when, when we started the AppSec or the ProdSec program at Spotify, uh, the two, these were the two axes that people uh, needed to, to succeed on. And I think the nice piece about getting AppSec folks who can code is as a hiring manager, this is where you have a great entrance for folks from underrepresented community. This is where you build your diversity. So you have a strong backend engineer or an aspiring backend engineer, whatever you're looking for, and you can teach them security on top of that, but they do possess the hard skill of coding and they possess the, we're not gonna attach an adjective of communication skills. And then you can plug into any engineering team and you can be effective. Awesome. I agree, yeah, I agree with a lot of that. I think um, that's a great way to think about it. Um, All right, actually, so, the reason, the, so oh, no. because of what uh, Nitsen said, I had actually said apps like people who can code are overrated because what should happen is you should get software engineers from other parts of the organization and teach them security instead of over-indexing on apps like people who can code, which I think is limiting in terms of who's able to go get that job. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. And I feel um, like you just maybe told me I was overrated, but that's okay. Anyways, um, so yeah, so the big reveal here for underrated. So there was, I think, more of a split here um, in terms of underrated. There weren't a lot of things that we had a lot of agreement on, but kind of overwhelmingly, we saw AppSec people who can code communication skills and then paved roads um, on this list. Um, we did a lot of, a couple more questions about paved roads. And it seems like uh, most people think those are pretty valuable. Um, is there anything on this list that, shouldn't be here.
I think the, the, the everything looks like I don't have I wouldn't say nothing should be there of the ones that are on the uh, that are in gray the security dashboard is the one that seems to me just a bit more most fraught with it could go in directions that make it overrated or just make it distracting or not useful but um the other quantified risks speaking as a security partner hopefully that remains underrated I'm with you there Julia um as well as security champions those can be tough to get a good program it could be time investment to get a good program going but I don't see that as is, is, uh, is fraught with um, kind of uh, maybe mis mistakes or leading to not leading to really good decision making like a, a poorly implemented security dashboard might do. All right, fair enough. So then I want to get into where we're really split. So I won't make you all play the game with me this time. But um, this is where we got roughly the same amount of people saying that they're overrated and underrated, which I think is a really interesting place uh, to be. Some of these things I think are like maybe newer on the scene, some of them are older on the scene, and so maybe we don't think they're so interesting. Um, but just um, curious to get kind of your thoughts on these in particular, maybe if there's one that you want to choose to, to talk about. Um, why do you think we're so polarized on some of these things? What are some of the, the reasons that, you know, you might have had like a really bad experience with something, or, or maybe we're doing something wrong as an industry, um, would be curious as to your thoughts on, on maybe the macro or, or choosing one of these things to talk to. I think a lot of these things would change based on the organizational context and the scale, to be honest. Uh, Security champions is, is what calls to me because uh, at Spotify, we have a, a great kind of testing ladder, which uh, has been very effective. And we're trying to think if we can squeeze security champions into this and we're trying to think how to scale it, you know, across our multiple offices and time zones in um it just seems like a super heavy investment for a company our size. While I think, you know, a much smaller company that's maybe more, more localized, then you, you kind of help to spread the breadth of the knowledge evenly. Uh, while I think a secure championship in a, in a mid to large size enterprise will just end up in, in, in silos. And then the person you invested in so much leaves the company or, or goes to do something else. And, so I'm, I'm not sure uh, on investment on return, but I think a lot of these things would just change depending on how many people you're working with and where security is at in the organization. Is security part of engineering or not? Uh, at Spotify, we see security as an engineering problem, but I know that that's not for everyone. So I'm curious to hear from everyone else. Yeah, I also thought the security champions call out was interesting. It seems like to me when someone says security champions, I think of it as a proxy for security culture. I think we all really want a strong security culture where people will volunteer issues and schedule our work into their sprints and, you know, be happy to work with security. Um, and security champions can help get you there, but it's also just a huge investment as people have said it's a huge amount of work it's very hard to scale the program as the company grows it's very hard to like have concrete things for engineers to do or like responsibilities or meetings just how you want to schedule your the program it can be a full-time job just running that so um we we don't really have a strong security champions program at chime today we just have like a slack channel and email distribution list where we send out things that we're inter we think are interesting um but it's not a formal program with you know meeting minutes or anything like that yeah absolutely uh yeah maybe mike and then asa Sure, I, I was just going to agree. I, our, we're very similar at Square in the sense of that security champions of a, a very passive here is, you know, who's interested in learning some more about security and just trying to build basically relationship building as opposed as opposed to like building a program around it. Um, I think um, what was mentioned before about um, is Spotify, like very, uh, there's a lot of apps. The, one of the answers is apps like people who can code as well as you're really, I think you just now said um, big emphasis on security engineering. 
uh, we also have a really big investment on our security org with engineering teams. And I think that's where I'd love to see, or if I had a wish for this graph, that we would have the, the formalized secure dev lifecycle would be much more, I suppose, underrated, or I guess more favored is how I would answer here, in the sense that either security is also building solutions, or there is much more of a predictable process that's perhaps easier to scale um, than security champions might be for the rest of engineering, meaning here's where you have your linting or here's where some appropriate uh, application security testing is going at a particular point in your life cycle, all the way over to that end of call it the bug bounty or pen testing. So maybe that's how I'll cheat with my answer. Fair enough. Asta. Uh, yeah, I don't want further want to bang on security statements programs, but I personally, <laughs> having attempted one myself before, like I definitely don't believe in security champions programs anymore. Like I do think that uh, there's probably better value in getting buy-in from the team to get them to build a feature in collaboration with security. Uh, and then I do think that we're kind of taking the responsibility away from ourselves. Our job as security teams is to make security more transparent to people, not to make everybody security engineers. That's the reason why we are there at the company, right? So our job is to let the business focus on what they are there to deliver. The other one that was interesting to me was the secure coding training one. And I can kind of see the balance there. On the one hand, I agree that it's like the blanket security training for everybody is probably not that useful and is maybe a little bit overrated, but like targeted security training that's really for particular teams on particular topics that are really relevant in their day-to-day -day is probably underrated and we need to invest in those types of things a little bit more so that teams don't feel like they uh, have to become like a security expert on all the things, but really it can be very in context and targeted for them. All right, thanks. I'm gonna to jump to the next one. So we got a um, kind of staggering amount of consistency when we asked uh, this one question. Uh, and I wanna show you the word cloud because this was a fun thing that uh, actually Patrick pulled together. We asked a question um, and uh, I'm just gonna tip the hand about the question, which I think we've all kind of covered a little bit is was the fastest depreciating thing that we do in AppSec or ProdSec? Um, so I'm curious, maybe like, uh, maybe just very, very quick speed round on this one. Um, we think that these things depreciate quickly. Um, a lot of us are still doing them as part of our program. So, so why are we still doing them? Do we have to do them to, to be able to enable the other stuff that we're doing? Or um, are we just, uh, I think Nitsen said like, you can't drop some of the vulnerability management stuff, um, but would be curious, maybe let's, uh, starting with Asta, just maybe a quick analysis of why are we still doing things in this word cloud? Um, I would say some of it may be driven by compliance. That's definitely one reason why we do things uh, because you have to check the box. Um, some of it, I, I do think that some of those things are maybe uh, actually valuable when done in a targeted way. Um, and maybe that's why it continues to be a part of our program, but not uh, like the focus of it. All right, Arkady, Mike, and then Nitsan. So some of these, even though it's a point in time assessment, like doing manual reviews, I still find helpful, even if it's very, again, whack-a-mole, but it's helpful to know what engineering is up to and where, where things are getting built and what's being built. I still find it valuable. Same thing for like pen testing, just to know where the issues are, even if it's a point in time assessment. I thought it was funny that documentation was on here. I <laughs> definitely feel that one is like very relatable. All of our documentation is constantly bad and out of date, but to consider like the, the you wouldn't not have documentation. Like it would be silly to suggest like we can't not document things, but um, so I thought that was funny that that was on there. Yeah, I think, uh, wait, I definitely agree there's a compliance in, in, in what Arcadia was just saying too. If, if I could try to add something different to this, I think there's still value in these. It's, it's just that in people, you know, we need to do a pen test at this point in time or here's a code review. I think for me, maybe the theme that I would tease out is that these don't feel like they, they scale very well. It's either I do it at a point in time and therefore I need to figure out how to go from annual all the way to continuous or that manual code review um, wow, how do I do that 
over you know a dozen you know merge requests per day on a daily basis. So that, that, my guess is that there's a there's a scaling part here that's missing that makes them more uh, depreciating. So yeah, be, being the last one and around, I, I feel like I don't have a ton uh, a ton to add. But one one thing I would want to highlight really is the word targeted and in. in uh, Ashta, you called it out. And I think that's really the, the key to all these ingredients and to how to use them. Uh, pen testing sometimes can be effective. It's just to have to be very targeted. And I, so I, I think more the kind of the root cause is how do we do some of these activities in a very targeted fashion. And then if it's very targeted, it doesn't need to scale to Mike's point, like these are all manual processes. And uh, they're super, you know, they're, they're, there's a lot of effort, there's a lot of time invested. And, and if you're, you're not investing it in the right place at the right time, then it goes to waste. So to me, the, the question comes more for how, how do you use these activities in a very focused, uh, almost one-off fashion. And at Spotify, we've just rolled out security tiers and this provides us a very simple and unified landscape of our services and our application and where the risks, risks are at and probably security tier one, which is the highest. Uh, would every once in a while, you know, justify pen testing because what's at risk is very high. But if something is a tier four, then, then why bother? Um, so I think systems like that are, are very helpful. Awesome. I love the idea of tiering. I think that's a, a great way to kind of strategically approach some of this stuff. All right. So I'm, I'm done asking y'all questions. I'm going to hand it over to Patrick to ask y'all questions. Um, and Patrick, you're up. All right. So one of the questions that we were really excited about was just what things do teams spend time on and what percentage of their time do they allocate to those things that they're choosing to do? So we kind of thought this is one of the most challenging decisions that a leader of a team has to make. And I'm supposed to be asking my panelists a question here. So my question to all of you is, go ahead, uh, Julia. How many months until this team burns out? So, Yes, this is everything that a uh, that an appsec or that a an appsec prodsec team could do. How long? How long is a team trying to do this last? Uh, Asta, I'll put you on the spot. Uh, yeah, no, I think. Uh... I like the point you're trying to make there subtly, right? Like at the end of the day, if you run a security team that doesn't prioritize, then you're probably not doing the right thing for the company, but also for your security team. Um, I think prioritization is important and that's probably the only way to like get yourself out of the hole. I, I assume that a security team like this is probably operating in this like operations mode every day. And then they'll probably get to the point where somebody's like, okay, I have learned enough about all the different things that make up AppSec. Let me go find a job where I can pick two of those things and do them in more depth and detail. So. Yeah. So this this is the the composed Frankenstein or the, the Frankenstein ProdSec program. This is uh, the straight average of everything that any program said that they did. Um, so this is this is the statistically average prod sec program. Um, and, and what was uh, gratifying to us was that no real team looked like this. No team out there tried to do, we broke it down to 16 categories. No team tried to do all 16 categories. Here's sort of examples of teams um, showing everybody has chosen to focus down um, somewhat. So uh, this Frankenstein team tries to do L16. We think not only should that not exist, but in practice, it doesn't exist. Focus is the name of the game here. So the typical number of these activities the teams were involved in was like eight things. Um, so my real question to the panel uh, after the burnout one is, 
what's your sense uh, of, of the right numbers of things for a team to be involved in? And what are ones that you're really happy that your team is doing or you want to do more of? And what are you trying to do less of? And when you're trying to do less, how do you give away or not do some of those things? Um, I guess we'll... Any, anybody want to start on that one or should I pick somebody? Uh, I can start. So let's see. For us, I would say the core part of most bandwidth of the team is focused on two things. One is strategic engagements with our engineering customers. And then two is building tooling to scale ourselves. Now, of all the things that uh, other things that are in here, we do do a handful of them as a part of our on-call uh, that is shared across the team. Um, and then that bucket fits things like bug bounty and running pen tests, but we largely don't do them internally ourselves um, and like answering one-off questions and things like that. So this is more sort of operational support, but I guess highest value things are uh, engineering to scale ourselves and strategic partnerships to scale ourselves. Thanks, Hasa. Anybody else want to share or take an opinion there? So uh, I would say broadly speaking, um, I think a clear sense of mission is really important for a team to be operational and successful and, and proud of what they do. There's no magic number, but if I had to pick one, I would say between two to three things that a team can do well uh, in terms of uh, what my team is working on is really thinking about paved paths, which is uh, Golden State and Spotify. And uh, so we look at the Golden State and we see how we can integrate tooling. And um, I'm actually... Ashta, I'm not gonna, I hope I don't uh, put you on the spot, but I'm gonna quote from one of our very early meeting because Netflix have, have always been an, an inspiration when it comes to OPSEC. Um, what was said was that the more, uh, the more secure the paved paths, the less engineers have to know about security. And then we know that we're going, doing a good job. And I would say that's a really good North Star overall. So if we can give you secure by default, then you can do your job. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, <laughs> I don't know that I have a, an exact number in mind of like what is the safe number of things for a team to be working on um, before the team's work burn out. But um, I just try to keep a pulse on um, people's work and how they're feeling. It's going to be fluid and change over time. Also, our priorities are going to change over time. Um, so we have the two squads on my team, AppSec and InfraSec, and actually over the past quarter or two quarters, even the application security folks have been leaning more into cloud security work because that was an area where like we identified there was room for growth. And so we've been prioritizing that instead. And then maybe in another quarter or two, we'll pivot back and focus on some more AppSec type work. Um, maybe as a, a general rule of thumb for this, I would say that we do try to prioritize whenever we find some sort of new issue or like remediation that needs to, to happen, we'll prioritize putting in a control in place to prevent new instances and you know stopping the bleeding as it were. Um, over actually remediating that issue. Um, we tend to think that that is more important for us and like a more scalable path forward. I think one of the things I can maybe, maybe add here is that I, I very much agree with the engineering approach that um, Nitsen and Asta were, were describing. And uh, for us, we have a, our security org has product security and application security, whether tooling or capabilities that are being built by those engineering teams. So maybe with the, with the group I'm with, uh, the security partners, we, uh, I'll focus there more on the aspect of where we choose our consulting time. And that is, um, we, we do tend to be focusing on the threat modeling, focusing on what the businesses are doing. And I guess maybe a way I would just kind of answer that one of those, the questions you brought up is we try to adapt to the culture and what the the what our business partners are building and providing and just going in and saying what's the risk it's, what, what is the risk here what is something that we want to influence on the roadmap and um that's that's setting that bifurcation of security engineering building the capabilities building up those paved roads that's secure by default that was mentioned and then we're focused on figuring out are those paved roads actually um meeting 
product needs, business needs, or are some businesses going off-roading and we need to drag over the security engineering to help them actually you know, lay down some pavement to, to stick with that metaphor? Thank you. Um, I like um, it. Sorry, we, Patrick, can I ask Julia to expand on her like eat your vegetables analogy that she uses for like the paved road adoption stuff? I think that's really on point for uh, what Mike was talking about. Oh, sure. Yeah, I'll, I'll quickly do it because I want to make sure the panelists have the airtime. But um, I, I kind of categorize security into a couple different things. And it's like the uh, my analogy has been like there's the eat your vegetable stuff, which just has to be done. It's things like vulnerability management. Um, fixing bugs, uh, uh, doing the little things to make sure that you're patched. Um, and then there's the bigger things that are bigger projects that might be, um, if I was extending my analogy, like starting a new fitness regime and like going to the gym all the time and, and spending a lot of time and work in, on doing that. So it's, um, yeah, a, kind of a path to uh, security health that involves little things and, and big changes. And so um, if you think about automating the little things or self-servicing the little things, then you can focus more time on your um, kind of bigger changes, but that's that's my analogy. I, I speak in a lot of analogies. I'm out. Thank you, Julia, and thank you, Austin. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay, time uh, important, uh, but let's go on to another question that Julia and I were really interested in. We're going to ask a whole bunch of our peers, what are you excited about? What's coming down the pipe? We were um, we, we wanted to see what the um, all of our, our peers are really looking forward to. And this question, uh, all I have to say is Clint Gibbler, we blame you for this result. Because here's what it looked like. SEMGREP, SEMGREP, SEML, RC2, CodeQL, more SEMGREP, a little bit of next-gen SaaS, a little bit of GitHub Advanced Security. It was, there were a couple of other things, but wow, people were consistent about this. Uh, this this was a little bit of a sur surprise to us, the, both this sort of coming up this much and the consistency. So um, my question to the panel then is best summed up in, in ridiculous meme form. So we've been down this road before. What did we learn last time? Why are we excited this time? I'm gonna remind you, static analysis was number four on the overrated list. So is, is next-gen static analysis gonna be on the overrated list in two years? Help. Maybe I could start because I have opinions. So I actually was surprised the static analysis was on the overrated list. I like static analysis. I think it um, does its job well. We are primarily a Ruby on Rails shop at Chime, which is a dynamic interpreted language. And we use a tool called Breakman and it has fantastic, like really high quality results, even for an interpreted language. So I can only imagine what the statically compiled language tools um, can output, hopefully even better stuff. Um, I think these tools like um, SEML and SEMGREP, I'm really excited to be able to easily write very like complex queries and catch these code patterns. I think that's gonna be like, I put the same thing in, in my response to this question. So um, I'm pretty excited about that. We're trying to build a, a tool internally this half to do something similar um, just to help around the deployment story. But I, it doesn't surprise me that it was one of the most hyped up tools. I even, you know, SAS has not disappointed me in the past. I'll put it that way. Thank you. Anybody else, different opinions? Well, as a fan of regular expressions, I'm quite disappointed that we, you know, that, that that just hasn't saved us from everything. But I'll say it is, I actually have to admit, I'm very surprised to see such consistency. Um, although I will say I absolutely love uh, SEMGREP and be actually able to give me an AST, let me go through it more accurately than my poor sad regex can't quite do. I'm going to take a guess that at least for me, what would stand out here to maybe SAS won't disappoint me is where I'm pointing it to. So rather Rather than my code, where, which actually we're actually quite a bit of a Ruby on, on Rails shop as well, but I'm much more of a fan of the idea of 
Terraform, meaning we can have some infrastructure as code. So I have a better idea what this cloud deployment looks like, and then be able to grep through that. And that even could be just a simple linter. It doesn't need the, the coolness of SEMgrep necessarily, but something that could give me much more um, uh, good feedback about what the infrastructure being deployed is, I think is where I will hopefully not be quite as disappointed in the realm of SAST, um, but possibly still a bit agnostic on SAST as being, you know, being great for the future. Thank you. Asta or Nitsen, care to weigh in? Uh, yeah, for us, I think in an environment where the generic static analysis has been disappointing in the past, I think some of my optimism with this comes from, oh, if we're going to make a targeted investment in code analysis, being able to use some of these new techniques to really look for targeted things in our environment that we no, uh, for example, vulnerable code patterns that we want to find across the fleet um, uh, and things like that. Like for me, I guess the targeted part of it and like use, using it with some re reservation on this is not going to be like a, something we'll uh, put in the way of like every time a developer checks in code, I think it will be a targeted investment for us for specific problems. And I feel some optimism for where that's going and see if that pans out. Yeah, I, I think uh, what I have to add, we're going to, to evaluate uh, SEML. I call it SEML, which is a wonderful um, Swedish baked good you should all check out. And now I've been enlightened that I should, I've been mispronouncing it for so long. So thanks for that. Uh, I think what, what's, what I was surprised that didn't come up is more some of the security platforms that are be being built. So a set of tools that is consistent, that has some ML on top of it, that is really, again, bringing us back into the targeted um, topic, which is what is the most important thing that I need to do right now as an engineer, because my services are at risk because of X, Y, and Z. So I think to me, that's the, that is what would, uh, would help scale. And if we have a couple of tools that are working maybe uh, on the application layer, on the container layer, and they're talking to each other, they also would help um, as a manager inform me where do I need to lean in a little more in the org, where there's bigger gaps. Um, yeah, so like I said, we're going to evaluate the tool. I'm happy there's excitement. It will, it will help me to, to sell it better perhaps to my engineering team, but I'm, I'm a skeptic. Thank you, Nitsen. So we'll go from this on to the last sort of canned question that we've got for the panel. We'll see what time we have left over for uh, any audience questions. I see one in the Q&A right now. So the other question that I think we we're interested in that we wanted to ask in an anonymous survey was, what's taboo? What are um, questions that uh, people are uncomfortable with? I will say, if you haven't seen Bridgerton, go do that. Uh, so this is the question that we asked. And we were, we were hoping to see taboo topics come up. We wanted to know what those were. And I think Julia and I were struck by the answers because to us, they didn't really feel taboo. I'm going to put some of those uh, questions up there or perceived taboo topics um, and um, what's interesting or what I want to ask you is do you feel like these are taboo topics and keep in mind these are coming from other prodsec and appsec peers and leaders who feel like they are so the question is um, what's your advice or your reaction to people who feel like these are taboo topics or do you feel like they are I see Mike nodding his head, so I'll pick on Mike. Okay. I'm trying not to, all, to, to, making sure to share the answers with everyone. I'm actually, you know, I'm kind of more shaking my head that they don't necessarily feel taboo. I think the, the second bullet, that everyone could be more honest about acceptable risk. Um, that sort of comes out to me maybe as uh, avoiding security purity. Um, and there was the, the SMS 2FA. We didn't talk uh, ab about that when we we're talking about overrated, underrated, but I'll just riff on that a little bit about the, diff the, the idea of what are our users' threat models? And maybe the, not every user's threat model is the same. And maybe we should have some mental capacity to 
organize different user groups into different threat models. So SMS 2FA might just be perfectly appropriate. Even getting someone to have 2FA period might get something, you know, might be an appropriate step there rather than thou must and only shall use YubiKeys, you know, you know, hardware tokens. Um, so maybe that might be a little bit of where that, that acceptable risk is going in the sense of just making sure we have good context about who we're talking about and who the risk is for rather than what the, the me speaking as a security informed person with my own threat model, that doesn't translate to everyone. So th that, that's, what I'm, that, that's what I'm going to try to, to, to tease out of this as you know, possibly a taboo-ish aspect. Asta Nitsen? Nitsen, I think, go for it. Sure. Um, so I think for me, kind of, yeah, it, these didn't stood out to me as taboos, but I think an interesting one is growth path in general. Uh, and that, again, really depends on the organization where you are, if, if overall there is a, a leaning toward the specialist versus T shaped engineers. And, and this is definitely a conversation that, that, has come up a lot, especially in my team, because most of the folks were, were engineers that uh, we, have, we have trained into the security field. Uh, I would say it's about the 50-50 split. And uh, so, so that question of down the road, someone comes as a backend engineer, they learn AppSec on the, on the fly and with some trainings and whatnot. And then two years later, where do they go? Uh, do they do they say bye bye to the to the security affair and move on to greener pastures or or not? So I think that's that's an, uh, uh, definitely an interesting one to to ponder. I'll give the the last word to Asta if she wants it. Otherwise, um, we can wrap up. Yeah, I would say none of these feel taboo. Definitely, I think the conversation around like what is the role of an AppSec team, I think the AppSec team shouldn't exist in the same form that it used to back in the day, right? Like, I don't think that's the core uh, competencies we should be bringing to the table anymore. And we should all be kind of coming uh, to the table with our customers and engineering and such to understand what is the value we need to be adding. Uh, to the business and like what are the skills and what are the functions we need to be able to do that. Thank you, Austin. Well, we are coming up against the hour. So at this point, um, I think it just remains to us to thank all of our panelists. We appreciate it so much. Uh, there was one question that came in the Q&A. Uh, please uh, join us in the Enigma Slack channel um, and we can talk about that afterwards. But I wanna just give a thank you again um, to our, our panelists, to Mike, to Nitsen, to Arkady, to Asta, thank you so much for sharing. It um, was, was phenomenal to hear from you. And then um, let me plug a uh, big reason that we're doing this here is um, Netflix information security is hiring. We've got lots of roles. Um, please, please drop into the uh, 2021 sponsored Netflix channel or go to Netflix jobs. Here are some of the names and faces um, to keep track of who actually have open recs right now and would love to talk to you. So that is our time. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much.